for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Okay, now to begin to understand the origins debate, one of the things we need to be very sure about is that we understand the genre or the literary style of Genesis. Yes. There are different types of literature in the Bible. There's poetry, as in the Psalms. There are parables. Well, Jesus used those to, as, you know, teaching tools. Uh, there's prophecy, as in the books of the last section of the Old Testament, Isaiah to Malachi. There are letters, as in the New Testament, epistles written by Paul, Peter, John, and the others. Uh, there's biography, as in the Gospels, and there's also autobiography, like in the books of Acts, where the author Luke is recording events that he is participating in. And then there's historical records, as in the books of the First uh, and Second Kings, and many other books of the Bible that contain accounts of events that actually took place, like the birth, life, death, and physical resurrection of Christ, for example. That's right. So what's Genesis? If, if it's poetry or meant to be understood as some, some sort of a, like a metaphor, then perhaps the millions of years we hear so much about could just be a part of how God created. Mm -hmm. English poetry often features rhythm and rhyme, in other words, sound patterns. Those features are really hard to translate into another language. And the great thing about Hebrew poetry, like in the Psalms, is that it features different kinds of parallelism. And, and, and a particular verb structure that translate well into other languages. Yeah, Hebrew scholar Dr. Stephen Boyd, whose PhD is in Hebraic and Cognate Studies, uh, performs statistical comparisons of verb type frequencies between historical and poetic Hebrew texts. And he came to the conclusion that Genesis 1 is clearly historical narrative, not poetry, with a 99.997% probability. Oxford Hebrew scholar Professor James Barr said that as far as he knows, there is no professor of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writers of Genesis 1 to 11 intended to convey to their readers the ideas that creation took place in a series of six days, the Genesis genealogies provided by simple addition present a chronology from the beginning of the world up to later stages in the biblical story, and Noah's flood was global. Which history is true? Either biblical history or the millions of years history. And we'll do a few examples, you'll get the idea. Given the current erosion rate, the continents should be eroded to sea level after only 10 million years. Now, the two competing histories give very different predictions for how many supernova remnants astronomers should find in the Milky Way. Yes, yeah, and the data supports <laughs> Biblical history. Wow. The Bible wins again. The Milky Way is not billions of years old. This is fun, yeah, isn't it? This is it's fun. Great. And, and, and there are literally <laughs> hundreds of examples like this. Creation or evolution? Which do you believe? Um, I'd probably have to say evolution. Evolution? Uh, evolution. Is there any powerful argument that makes you think evolution is true that causes that confusion? Um, I think the studies that have been done on uh, apes and monkeys are pretty compelling. Uh, mostly fossil records and just databases of really just the fossil records. In your church background, were you ever exposed to any scientific evidence for creation by your church leaders, pastors, anything like that? Definitely not. Nothing in particular, no. Uh, no, I don't believe so. Do you uh, still attend church today or not anymore? Um, only for holidays. We kind of stopped going together as a family, but... Did your church leaders, student leaders, bring in any creation teaching that showed you there was scientific evidence to support the Bible's account of creation? Uh, yes. Yeah, we learned a lot about different um, creationist scientists and the proof of young earth creationism. What are you studying now? Biology. Biology, right. Steeped in evolution. So. Uh, but you're not convinced by the evolutionary arguments in your biology classes? No. Still attend church today? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, every Sunday. Would it be fair to say then that being able to discuss creation openly at church uh, has helped strengthen you in that area, prepare you uh, for what you've learned here at college about evolution? Yes.
Have you ever stopped to wonder about a day? Isn't a day just long enough to get work done? No matter whether we're working at a desk or in a field, we all get tired by the end of the day. Evening provides just enough time to recoup and a night's sleep just enough rejuvenation for tomorrow. Where did the mechanics of a day come from and why are they so synchronized with humans? Think about it. All the factors needed for life, like the right temperature ranges, seasons, and growing cycles, oxygen levels, gravity, and sunlight. All of these are governed by the rotations and orbits in motion today. Just when did this all get started? When did all these planets step into motion with their coordinated movements so perfect for life? Let's take a look at what the Bible says. After God created light, He divided the light from the darkness. Then He called the light day and called the darkness night. And this was all on the first day, setting the stage for the rest of creation week. Then God commanded, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons, and for days and years. If the word day here is not a literal day, then the word years being used in the same verse would be meaningless. God set up a day as a full rotation of the earth on its axis, and a year as one complete revolution of earth around the sun. He spun this timekeeping planetary clock into motion at the beginning, and it's been in place ever since. Why is this important? Well, from a practical standpoint, without this complete system, we would not have creation as we know it. From a personal standpoint, not believing God's word starting from the very first page and believing secular science instead sets up a pattern for how we consider the rest of the Bible. It's like a gate that governs who our authority will be in life, either man or God. Think about it. When reading the Bible's creation passages at face value, it says that God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six ordinary days. Everything had to be set into motion during the same creation week for life to be sustainable. In fact, God even said this as clearly as possible to the Israelites in the fourth of the Ten Commandments, in the only part of Scripture He wrote with His own hands. But many Christians today believe that these days could have been thousands, millions, or even billions of years long. But why compromise on such a clear teaching of Scripture, one where each of the six days are bounded by evening, morning, and a number, and every time in the Bible any one of these qualifiers is added to the word day, it always means an ordinary day. And what about God even telling the Israelites directly to believe in a six-day creation week and to base our work week just like it. God could have created everything in an instant or in a single day, but He chose to create over six days to set out a pattern for us to live by. Does God want us to believe differently today because of what secular science says? Just who is our authority? Surely stretching out the days is an attempt to fit evolutionary time into Scripture. It's imposed into the text, not part of it. Scripture also clearly places this six-day creation week just thousands of years ago based on the genealogies of Adam, the very first man, is compromising on this teaching and the many compromises that usually go along with it really necessary? Think about this for a minute. This process of day with light and heat and night with darkness and cold, along with days adding up into years, had to start somewhere. It had to have a beginning. Can you imagine a day lasting for thousands of years or darkness? If Earth's rotation speed was slower, our days would be too hot and our nights too cold to support life. Any faster and the wind speeds would be too extreme. God had to set up this cycle with all the planets and orbits set into motion at a certain point of time. They are all connected. And the Bible sets this time as just thousands of years ago, not millions. We need light for food to grow. We need seasons for different types of plants to grow in the same regions. The Earth orbits the Sun with a tight habitable zone. If Earth was any closer, we'd fry, any further away, and we'd freeze. It's a perfect distance for photosynthesis. Our sun is also the perfect color and mass. Any larger and its brightness would change too quickly, producing too much high-energy radiation. A stable water cycle would also be impossible without the sun just like it is. Any change in the orbital tilt of our planet would make our climate impossible. The Earth and Moon work together to create tide cycles for ocean life to thrive. Earth's magnetic field is also perfect for life, protecting us by deflecting most of the solar material speeding towards us at 1 million miles per hour. Without the magnetosphere, solar particles could strip the Earth of its protected layers, which shield us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation. Animals even migrate using Earth's magnetic field, Earth's gravity, axial tilt, rotation period, magnetic field, 
crust thickness, oxygen-nitrogen ratio, carbon dioxide, water vapor, and ozone levels are just right. All of these were carefully calibrated by God during creation week to sustain life. Bees and butterflies, created just two days after vegetation, had to be present during creation week to pollinate and bring food for people and animals. Indeed, God has designed everything carefully for life on earth. And Isaiah says, For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Looking for answers about what the Bible teaches about creation, the fossil record, dinosaurs? Download the Genesis Apologetics app from the iTunes or Google Play stores for answers to these questions and more. <laughs>